further ado, Anthony Corbo. Before I do anything here, one more time for Nora. That was my word. Tina and Ed and Alex and, and Elaine just, it's been really, really an honor to be a part of this group. And it's, it's uh, yeah, you guys inspire me to try to be better every day. So thank you to all of you, first and foremost, and everyone else for coming out tonight. Uh, my roommate was uh, watching The Simpsons balled up on the couch tonight. And, uh, there's nothing more I want to do than be him at that moment. But everyone coming out, all these stories made it more than worth it. So just thanks again. Also, uh, I realized that FedEx decided not to print the last five pages of my uh, my uh, story here, or someone else has it now. So uh, uh, I'll move to my phone at some point tonight. But, um, the story is about stillness. The two stared at each other, both unsure of what to make of the other in front of them. It wasn't the first time Eddie had almost hit somebody, and by the looks of her, he imagined she was quite used to haphazardly running into traffic, uh, frustrating an endless list of Lord of the Land drivers. Eddie waited for a reaction, either a flipping of the bird in his direction or some inaudible yelling beyond his windshield. Strangely, neither occurred. Replacing them were several moments of petrified eye contact between the driver and pedestrian, where the shock of a near-death manslaughter or near-death near manslaughter moment would have traditionally have transitioned to anger. The two remained frozen. Eddie began to suspect there was a greater force at play. On the other side of the windshield, Missy was at once overjoyed that the car came to a stop, overcome with dread that the automobile did not plow her down scared shitless about what was to come next, and at least a little bit relieved just to see another soul, even if it was the pudgy and confused man of an upper middle age in what appeared to be a decommissioned cop car. <laughs> in previous situations like these, she had likely flipped off the driver and gone about her day, uh, but she knew this was nothing like before. She needed help, and this is what the world was offering. She tried to move and get the driver's attention, but her limbs simply were not ready to respond yet. The driver wasn't moving either, like they were both in some kind of a stasis. Did I just stop time? She caught herself wondering. <laughs> Missy was sure she was dead. <laughs> Eddie only broke his gaze with the stranger in his headlights when the image of a black car began entering his peripheral creeping towards the, spotlight of, uh, towards the stoplight of an intersection a few dozen yards in front of them. The drunken, rub the drunken rubblings in the background began to stand out over his Crown Vic's gentle hum as Eddie attempted to break through his stasis. He could make out a head rising through the sunroof, but his weathered eyes made it impossible to see where it was looking. After the passing of even more lingering seconds, with Eddie growing further confused about the situation in front of him, uh, and the woman framed in his windshield, still looking more mannequin than pedestrian. A voice finally cried out in the car's direction. Here, it shouted, laying on the horn with a fury. The head dipped back into the car and four individuals emerged from the alleys that bordered the gas station opposite the intersection. Uh, they piled into the car with one grip in the hood like he was an ornament in the bow of a pirate ship. The sounds of doors slamming and horns blaring was enough to bring Missy back into the reality, though she needed to move fast. The car, now clearly a blacked out Dodge Charger with a menacing grill, whipped around the intersection and was fast approaching where Missy stood, on a pace to lay waste to the crown dick in front of her and its driver, whose eyes were, dark and were darting back and forth in a fervor. His hands remained clenched on the steering wheel. She decided that if this is how she would die, sandwiched between the grill of two cars, amongst a wreckage of bodies and likely lots of fire. It would be how she died. She felt like she, desired, she deserved it too, after dragging this poor old soul into what would surely become his grave. The Dodge was just a few feet away from Missy before she had a change of heart and dove into the grass next to the road without putting any thought into bracing herself. Her elbow and knee hit the ground while the rest of her body tumbled over itself down the slope. Her momentum was finally defeated by a tree trunk ahead of her, numbing her body once again and forcing her brain to go through a brief reboot. When she came back to, Missy wasn't sure how much time had passed or what had become of the scene above her. She was nearly convinced she was dead and was about to accept her fate until her nerves kicked back in. 
the breaks in her right arm reminding her that she was very much alive. It wasn't a compound fracture, but it wasn't much better. Missy knew she couldn't so much as raise it, and with the feeling of concussion beginning to creep in, she let herself lay back down momentarily. The cool Wisconsin air felt soothing. Uh, Missy was nearly ready to let the chill consume her before the guilt over the surely destroyed Crown Vic and its driver came rushing to the top of her mind. She needed to be sure of what, was, what she was responsible for before committing herself to the wind. With the strength she had left, Missy used her left arm to propel her to her feet and began walking uphill, ready to fade out the moment she reached the top. While Missy tumbled, Eddie was having more difficulty than ever processing what his eyes were telling his brain. The conflict between the two was overwhelming, and Eddie found comfort in the only part of his mind that was unoccupied. Disappearing back to his most cherished mo memories, from a mediocre and underwhelming career on the force that was well in his past. It was a career that seemed to have begun and ultimately peaked when he was just a child in the shadow of his police father. As Eddie traversed through his memories, he was able to brush past the demeaning gaze of his former peers' faces, who only saw him as an object to pity and had accepted that uh, at that point that a slacker like Eddie would never fulfill his father's legacy. Diving even deeper into his mind, he ignored every transfer into another department he had faced, each coming once his partners and superiors stopped having the patience for his lethargy and decided to shuffle him on down the line. For the first time in years, Eddie even managed to visualize the pain of his father's funeral, where at just eight years old, he came to grips with the town hero, who always seemed to be more interested in the name of justice than looking after his own son getting knifed in the back by a frightened meth dealer and during his rushed and poorly executed sting operation. Eddie spit on his grave and swore during the ceremony, realizing that if this were to be the fate of the most widely beloved person he had ever known, uh, to be knifed and sworn and spat at, he knew his fate would certainly be worse. Faced with impending doom, Eddie's mind didn't linger there. It was the first time he had ever been able to think past that memory. Instead, he reveled in the, only true, in the only truly positive memory he had held on to since that funeral. It was the annual Chicago Police for Chicago Fire softball game, nearly 15 years prior. When the Reds took offense to a few particular phases some cops had slurred at them between innings, the fire department pitcher began lobbing the softball directly into the limbs of the police batters, striking enough out at the plate for the cops to resort to bringing Eddie up. <laughs> He was a rarely used pinch hitter brought on to fill out the roster. Eddie stepped to the plate, his stance poor and his grip weak. He hit a home run with his first swing. He wouldn't hit another runner for the team, or even make another appearance at the plate. But Eddie knew that as the ball began to ascend, growing higher each second, he would be a hero for at least that moment. The soaring softball was about to reach its peak when Eddie recognized a bloody and limp figure approaching from the outfield, the same woman who just moments ago was framed up in his windshield. As the concussed Missy was approaching the top of the road, she made out a bright orange-yellow glow through her hazy vision. She was sure flames would be dancing along the road as she reached the top, but when it became clear that the glow belonged to street lamps and not fire, Missy was left with more confusion than at any point in the night. Her confusion set in further, and she realized it would not be easy to find answers. Again, I would have to be dead, she further convinced herself. The Crown Vic and its old man driver stood pat as it was clutching the steering wheel of two hands. After a lengthy scan of the street, she noticed skid marks near her leaping point, warping in shape to align the old cop car as if it was a chalk outline. The lifeless body of the man who was gripping onto the hood of the, of the Dodge as it beamed at Missy lay next to a large dent in the cop car, shattered glass from the window covering him like a blanket. He was drenched in leather, a jacket, pants, and mask with the eyes dipped shut. The Dodge was nowhere in sight, but Missy was sure it wasn't far. Her mind was in no state to be determining apparition from reality, so, her body, so she let her body determine what her next move would be. It knew that their only chance of survival would be in the Crown Vic. She limped towards the passenger door and latched onto the handle, needing an exceptional amount of strength to even lift it with her still functioning arm. It wouldn't budge. Missy pulled again and again before accepting that the door was locked and her fate was sealed. She stood limply beside the door, noticing and listening to the roar of the Dodge's engine grow closer. 
looping around the stretch of land before calmly turning off and parking directly behind the Crown Vic. Only one figure emerged just as Leather drenched as a dead teammate on the pavement. He didn't say a word as he approached Missy, but he let out a hiss through his mouth as he breathed in and out. He stopped directly in front of her, his phlegm being the only noise that broke the Crown Vic. Whoop, that's where we left off. The Crown Vic's hum. She stared him directly, she stared him in the eyes through his mask. She was ready. How could hell be any worse? <laughs> Pity what you did to Jeremiah, he hissed. Though you're not looking much prettier yourself. And the thing let out a demonic laugh. You know you're leaving here with us. You're coming home and I don't much care if you're dead or alive. Missy only stared back with the same half-dead expression, gazing into the heat creature's eyes without fear let alone any other emotion. Her disinterest in his terror only provoked him further. He raised a fist to deliver a striking blow, intended to knock Missy's head directly through the window below, behind her, surely giving closure to her, her concerns about being dead or alive. Missy's body again reacted on its own. She ducked the punch and used her left arm to shield her head from any falling glass. The monster's fist created a hole in the window, firmly lodging his arm in the pane of glass. This was a moment that brought Eddie back to his senses. He turned his head for the first time in what felt like several lifetimes, becoming increasingly aware of the dents and glass throughout his car, as well as a bloody arm protruding through his passenger side window. Eddie remembered everything, the woman he almost hit and her, near, her nearly lifeless body permeating through his most profound memory. The dots that blind in with high beams it was just moments ago attempting to fuse both engines and all bodies in a godly explosion. The screech he heard, which he was sure was his soul being ripped from his body. And after all that, he remembered his longing to be a hero, a feeling that escaped him when he was just a child. He locked eyes with a demonic figure bleeding down his door, and he floored the gas pedal. Oh.